Hey guys, I'm Dov, and today I'm back with another Total War Warhammer 2 Faction Overview. So, for those of you who are new to this, this series, essentially what I'm going to do is go through the roster of this time, the Tomb Kings, and we're going to talk about each unit individually, and then talk about the roster as a whole, some of its strengths and weaknesses, uh, a few ways to play as them, and also ways to play against them, and just generally uh, talk about the Tomb Kings for those of you who are thinking about getting the DLC or who just want to know their roster. Maybe you don't have the DLC and you want to know what they can bring to the table, or you want a preview of what you could potentially take if you do get them. You know, there's multiple different reasons why you may want to uh, use this information, but let's get to it. So, straight into uh, just some general things about the Tomb Kings. Uh, number one is a lot of their characters are weak to fire damage. A uh, number of their characters have this minus 25% weakness to fire, so that is something to keep in mind um, as you are, you know, making counter builds. Uh, the exception being Katep, he is not weak to fire. I want to say the Lich Priests as well are not, so the Casters and Katep are not. Um, but the other lord choices and your tomb prince, your necrotect, are all weak to fire damage. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> of course, tomb kings are undead as well, which means they do not partake in leadership mechanics, which kind of makes them overpowered to begin with. Um, at least as the at the time of recording this, crumbling really doesn't work very well, so um, they just end up basically not taking in leadership, essentially having an unbreakable army, which is a bit tough, but I'm hoping that they uh, address that uh, issue in the future. I'm not going to get too much into that right now, but uh, just be aware that they are, of course, undead. They don't have access to lore of vampires, unlike the other two undead factions, but that's okay, they have another lore of magic, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So, let's get to the roster then. We're going to start with the lord choices. You've only got one generic lord choice with the Tomb Kings, and what would you know? It's a Tomb King! Uh, super creative, guys. <laughs> uh, let's have a look here. He has three different mount options. You can take him on foot, which is just shameful. A skeletal steed, um, which, you know, obviously just a horse, basically. The chariot, uh, Tomb Kings are obviously well known for their chariots. <clears throat> and the chariot does give him bonus versus infantry, 80 charge bonus, 110 armor, and 74 speed. So pretty fast. Uh, 76 speed on the skeletal steed. And yeah, pretty straightforward. The Kemrian War Sphinx is a big single model monster, obviously gives him armor piercing, again anti-infantry, decent charge bonus, decent attack, and actually really good defense on this guy. 42 defense for a big monster lord is not bad at all. 68 speed, 80 leadership, and 95 armor on the War Sphinx. Um, in terms of his abilities, we're going to see several of these abilities again several times, so it's good to go through them all now. We've got the Curse. This is a one-time use a uh, huge AoE direct damage effect that goes off automatically when he goes below 50% HP. There are a number of different curses for the different characters, but the Lord level curse just does direct damage. Uh, let's see, it's uh, strong versus multiple combatants, weak versus a single combatant. So it does look like it's a more uh, multi-model spell scaling, like uh, Flock of Doom or something like that. I don't know exactly what the ideal model count for this to hit is, but considering that you don't really have a lot of control over it, um, yeah, you, you're you just going to have this go off once, basically, if your lord takes a bunch of damage, so you probably don't want it going off in the first place, but it can kind of get you back in the game in the right situation. Uh, My Will Be Done is another lord ability for all of the Tomb King's lords, gives plus five melee attack and defense in an area of effect. This is quite handy due to the fact that Undead generally have crap attack and defense stats, so giving that nice little plus five attack and defense. You know, vampire counts have vigor mortis, tomb kings have my will be done. Reanimate is just the area of effect leadership buff, and tomb strike is another uh, ability for the tomb king's characters that gives extra melee attack, weapon damage, and allows them to cause terror 
Obviously, a lot of them have mount options that will allow them to do so anyway, but some of them don't, so like if you take them on the chariot or the horse, for example, you can still take Tomb Strike, have them cause terror for a short amount of time. In terms of the items for the Tomb King, he does have two items, both of which are pretty decent. The Scorpion Armor gives him 22% damage resistance once his health goes below 50% HP. So, you know, you have that curse go off, then you get 22% damage resistance just to try and tank out a little bit more, which is definitely useful. He also has the amulet of Fasta. Fasta? That's just hilarious. <laughs> uh, gives minus 30 armor and minus 48 missile parry uh, in an area of effect. I actually haven't used this super often to good effect, but it is nice to have an extra armor sundering option, and the minus missile parry means that you could potentially pair this with like a cheeky, uh, like a mass skeleton archer build for some interesting effect. Again, I haven't really used it myself. It is a pretty expensive item, but could potentially be interesting. Moving on to the first Legendary Lord, we've got High Queen Kalita. She's got the Chariot, of course, and a Necro Serpent. So this is kind of like a Demigriff, basically, uh, with Poison. And yeah, she has really, really good combat stats. She's kind of a duelist character. Um, she's very good at uh, fighting enemy lords and heroes. That being said, she doesn't have the biggest HP pool in the world, and she does lack a monstrous mount, like a truly, you know big monster mount. I guess, you know, the Necro Serpent does have armor piercing, pretty good armor piercing damage overall, good charge bonus. I mean, her stats just across the board are really, really good, um, but the, the HP is a little bit lacking in comparison to some of the big monster lords. So, uh, yeah, if we have a look at her abilities, she also has the Curse, My Will Be Done, and Tomb Strike, so not going to go through those again. Uh, her unique abilities here, Blessing of Asaf is a ranged buff, gives extra missile damage, reload skill, and armor piercing missile damage in an area of effect around her constantly. So, if you are planning on taking, uh, like, a heavy bow shabti or bone giant build, then Kalita certainly can be a good pick for your lord choice. She also has Venom Wave. This is essentially like your, uh, you know, your Verminous Valor explosion, but it actually does poison damage. And, uh, yeah, she also only has one item, the Venom Staff, Magic Missile, sort of like the Scar Sticks Prada does kind of a big explosion. I haven't found this to be wildly useful, but it's there. Moving on, we've got Grand Hierophant Katep, the one non-flammable Tomb King Lord. That being said, he is basically made of paper, uh, extremely squishy caster-specific Lord. He does have three mount options. We can see the Skeletal Steed once again, and the Chariot. <clears throat> Just as a quick note, the Chariot does give him 95 armor. He still has terrible combat stats, but at least he does have 95 armor and has a 74 speed to be able to get out of trouble. Uh, the Casket of Souls is an artillery piece. Uh, not super accurate, but it does give him an, a number of extra effects. If we have a look here, uh, he gains Siege Attacker, obviously only for campaign, but he does have this Covenant of Power, a huge increase to his power reserves, so you can just cast more spells. It's a very, very useful ability to have. Then being a good Caster Lord, he also has Arcane Conduit to give himself more regeneration. The lore of Magic he has is the unique uh, lore for the Tomb Kings, lore of Nehkara. The lore attribute for that is this Restless Dead here. It does give map-wide uh, healing for 7 seconds. It's not a ton of healing, but it's something, certainly. And only will hit the undead units, but uh, yeah, it's very nice, especially because there are some good, really, really good cheap spammable spells for this lore. He also has a Bound Vortex, this Sandstorm here, three uses, does pretty good damage, um, combined with some other abilities can be very good uh, against certain factions, certainly. Uh, the spells for the Lord of Nehkara, we're going to go through those briefly here. We've got Incantation of Cursed Blades, for only three wins of magic, extra 20% weapon damage, and uh, armor piercing. If you overcast it, it's 5 wins of magic, and it adds a plus 16 bonus versus large, which is, uh, I th want to say it's the only spell that gives a bonus versus large. It's a super, super useful effect to put on uh, various units. You know, you can use, like, Carrion, for example, get that extra bonus versus large to go after a flying character, like a flying caster character, especially. 
Um, you, you can use that on Nekara horsemen to have them beat down a uh, number of other cav units. They can beat down like wild riders, for example, quite easily. So just a super useful spell and again, cheap and spammable so you can get that lore attribute up as much as possible. Same thing with Incantation Protection, 6 Winds of Magic here for 44% physical resistance on a single target. If you upgrade, it's 10 Winds of Magic, so a bit more expensive, but it does last for quite a long time, a full 36 seconds. So uh, again, nice cheap spammable spell. 44% physical resistance is quite useful to get your Lord, you know, out of a pickle, um, or just generally try and keep a high value unit alive. Incantation of Righteous Smiting is sort of like the Cursed Blades, but it's for ranged uh, attacks. It does armor piercing and missile damage, and if you upgrade for 10 Winds of Magic, you can get plus 40 reload skill. It's, of course, 6 for the base. Again, nice and useful for buffing up your ranged units, your Bow Shopty, Bone Giants, things like that. Especially if you're running like a Kalita Death Star build, you can use this on a specific uh, target, and they'll just get an absolute crap load extra missile damage and incantation of vengeance is essentially like a more powerful melkos mystifying yasma does dam direct damage uh, pretty good against multiple opponents and it also does 24 percent speed debuff if you upgrade it it does uh 48 speed debuff so it can potentially just slow units to a crawl with that a uh, nice control spell but it is a little bit expensive on the winds of magic for my taste um, for how much damage it does, but you do still see it occasionally used for the speed debuff. Skullstorm is a Vortex, which, uh, of course, if you're taking Kotep, you have the other Vortex, you can take this one too, for that sweet double Vortex action, especially against the Horde faction like the Skaven. Can be very, very useful to have. Uh, let's see here. Incantation of Desiccation is an, basically an area of effect in Feebling Foe. It is 15 wins of magic, but that... Standard minus 26, minus 27 melee attack and defense is pretty devastating. It also lasts a pretty long time. 38 seconds is quite a long time, so you do see this get used pretty often. 15 wins of magic is quite a bit, but if you upgrade it to 21, then it's minus 44 melee attack uh, for 38 seconds. So if you're up against, like, let's say the green skins and they're on a huge power spike with Wa and maybe, like, uh, Here We Go or something in an area of effect... Um, maybe some Fists of Gork going on a specific unit. You can drop this to just nerf their stats real quick and counteract a lot of that. Um, or, you know, to help support like a Monster Death Star or something. Just generally useful to have that uh, stat debuff. So, there's the Lord of Nehkara. Now rounding out Kotep. He's got the Lich Staff here. So, every time you cast a spell, you give your opponent plus 15 ability recharge, which... You know, makes him a great against the green skins and really, really good against the other undead factions and just generally anyone who relies on magic. I do like Kotep quite a bit in a number of matchups. Skaven, green skins, uh, he's pretty underrated in my opinion, especially on the chariot. He can be an absolute menace with that double vortex, does good anti infantry damage, reasonably decent armor, and he's not going to just get fireballed to death quite so easily as other lords will. Speaking of other lords, let's move on to the baddie, Arkan the Black. He is the villain of the Tomb Kings. He carries Lore of Death rather than Lore of Nekara, has a skeletal steed and a chariot mount, just those two. Lore of Death, we all know well, so not going to go through it too much, but you know these spells. Uh, in terms of his items, he's got the Staff and the Gash, gives him extra power recharge rate and minus ability recharge. So that's pretty nice, and then he also has the Tomb Blade of Arcan, which used to be cr just crazy broken healing. Now instead he gets five, count them, five summons of Skeleton Warriors. And this is not a regular unit of Skeleton Warriors either. It's actually, it actually has 150 unit models compared to the Skeleton Warriors 120 regularly, so... Um, they are very, very good. It makes him an incredibly powerful control lord because you can get those extra unit models. And, of course, Lore of Death is just great utility in itself. So, yeah, Arkan the Black, a super solid lord choice. You see a lot of Arkan in competitive. Same with Cetra. Cetra is the other really good competitive choice, in my opinion. Um, he has an upgraded version of My Will Be Done that gives a bigger area of effect, a 55 meter Area of Effect, uh, plus 5 melee attack and defense. He also has Wrath of Petra, which is, uh, again, another explosion. This time it does 
magic and fire damage and uh, does pretty good uh, pretty good damage against unarmored infantry it's not that great against armor but it does allow him to escape he also has a uh, number of mounts here um, skeleton steed and uh, war sphinx and a unique chariot the chariot of the gods which gives him flaming magic damage a hundred charge bonus which is insane absolutely insane a really really good armor piercing and anti-infantry plus 25 bonus versus infantry only 30 melee defense but 110 armor uh, 84 speed so blazing fast super cool mount to uh, see <clears throat> he also has lord nakara which we just talked about and then Two items here. Crown of Nehakara uh, gives uh, all allies in range 10% AP and weapon damage and 8% charge bonus. Can be very nice if he's leading like a pack of chariots or something. And the Blessed Blade of Petra, this is something you see quite often. Uh, because of that blinded effect, gives himself fire damage, which I mean he can obviously start with baseline on the chariot. But if he's like say on the War Sphinx, then he wouldn't have that. So this would give him that fire damage, and it also gives the blinded effect. So when he hits someone else, it gives them minus 26 melee attack and defense and minus 40% accuracy. This is just insanely good for hero duels because of that minus 26 attack defense. Um, yeah, it just means that you're going to nerf your opponent's lords or monster stats, and then he's going to be able to take them down a lot easier. Or or if you have him on the chariot, and you can just run him, you know, willy-nilly all over your opponent's army and apply this to, like, all of their units, basically, it can be an absolutely brutal debuff to be carrying. So, yeah, definitely always recommend the Blessed Blade of Petra on Cetra. Crowd of Nekara sometimes I don't take if I'm trying to optimize for cost, but it can be useful, certainly. That rounds our rounds out our lord choices for the tomb kings the four legendary lords and one generic for the characters we've got the necrotect again only a chariot mount for him but uh, i think we're sensing a theme here he's got a few abilities to help buff your construct type units a wrath of the creator gives plus five melee attack and five percent ap to constructs only and construct is a keyword we'll get to that in just a minute uh, Stone Shaper, same thing. Constructs get plus 10 armor, 10% missile resistance, which is really nice. And then, of course, he has Restore, which allows him to heal a Construct. In addition, a few items here. We've got Vambraces of the Sun, uh, minus 9 melee attack, and 20, plus 22% weakness to fire in an area of effect. This actually can be pretty decent compared with certain units. Cetra, for example, has fire damage. There's a couple others that we'll get to that could potentially get some good synergy with this. They are pretty expensive, but uh, it is a constant effect, so you do get some value there. Elixir of Might gives plus 26 uh, melee attack and weapon damage to an ally. It doesn't have to be a construct, but certainly useful to use on a construct. The uh, generic melee hero is the Tomb Prince. He's got anti-large AP as well as a shield. Only 70 armor, which is not the most in the world, but 48 melee defense is quite good. Uh, again, anti-large AP looks like a plus 25 bonus versus large because, again, he's carrying a halberd. Uh, he's got a skeletal steed, which gives him some mobility. The chariot makes him more anti-infantry focused. Uh, he has a few abilities. Guardian, of course, we all know well. Uh, also, 15% physical resistance, we've got uh, Curse of Joth, so his version of the curse gives minus 26 melee attack and rampage in an area of effect. And we've also got Tomb Strike, which we've seen before. Uh, Necrotect, I don't think he has a curse. Yeah, he doesn't actually have a curse. The Lich Priest does, however. You've got three options for Lores of Magic, Death, Light, so you can get like Nets, Shen's Burning Gaze, Banishment, that kind of stuff. And uh, Lord of Nekara, obviously. And the Lich Priest's version of the curse gives minus 60 armor in an area of effect. Again, because you can't really control this, um, it can be a little bit tough to make it happen reliably, but it's generally useful to have if you have the funds. In terms of items, the Lich Priest has probably one of the most powerful magic regenerate regen items in the game. Uh, this 
scrolls of mighty incantations basically for each allied unit when you when you use this it isn't on use it lasts 11 seconds but for each ally in the area of effect up to a maximum of five allied units um, you will get an increase in reserve and recharge rate and it will uh, increase you know per unit so ideally you want to have him sitting in the middle of a big blob of friendly units when you use this uh, and then you'll get a ton of extra winds of magic it's uh you know before they capped it at max five it was honestly just completely broken you could almost get an endless amount of winds of magic but yeah certainly an extremely powerful item especially if you have lore of death to get the extra power recharge rate from life leeching but uh, yeah, super useful item. Uh, the other one here is the uh, End Kills Canopy. Gives 66% magic resistance to himself and allies in an area of effect. Pretty useful to help counter like uh, you know big area of effect magic spells. But it is a relatively expensive item. If you're going to be facing somebody like I don't know Bretonia or the Wood Elves, though, it may be useful to have just to help counter the magic damage units as well. Finally, we are finished with the characters, so let's move on to the infantry. We've got Skeleton Warriors and Skeleton Spears. No surprises here. Crap combat stats, but, I mean, they're undead, so they're unbreakable, and they cost fear for 300 points, 325 specifically, 350 for the Spears. They have 30 melee defense, and they come with small bonus versus large. No surprises. They've got a, sort of a mid-tier DPS infantry. Nehkara Warriors, pretty good combat stats. Still, I mean, not as good as Empire State Troops, but 32 attack, 21 defense, 33 weapon strength. They got uh, 45 armor as well, not too bad, but no missile block chance, and again, undead. The uh, Spears do have a regiment of renown here, the Scorpion Legion. They've got poison attacks. That's that's it. They've just got poison. Oh, no, they do have extra armor as well, I forget. They're up to 45 armor compared to only 10 for the uh, regular Skeleton Spears. So, uh, yeah, generally a pretty useful regiment of renown because they're cheap. They Poison Spears are always nice to have. For the elite infantry, there are Tomb Guard, which come in two variants, plus a Regiment of Renown. The Shielded variant is extremely cost-effective. They got 41 melee defense, only 50 armor. So for, uh, you know, kind of a mid-tier Shielded infantry, that's not the most. If you compare to, like, Chaos Warriors have obviously a lot more, uh, you know, things like Longbeards and stuff like that are going to outclass them on armor. These guys do have really good weapon strength, though. 42 total weapon strength. Only 9 of which is AP, but still, that's a lot of total weapon strength. And the 32 attack and 41 defense is quite good in terms of stats. Still not as good as Graveguard, but they're a decent frontline unit. The Halberd variant is one of the few shielded Halberd units in the game. Again, only 50 armor, but they do have that 55% missile block chance. Uh, only 29 weapon strength here, but a plus 19 bonus versus large. 47 melee defense, 25 attack. Uh, pretty decent charge defense versus large, as you would expect. Uh, pretty good against factions, which you might expect cab and monsters. Um, the, regiment of the regiment of renown is the Kepper Guard, and I'm gonna be honest with you guys. This is probably, in my opinion, one of the worst regiments of renown in the game. Um, I know a lot of people really, really like them, but the reason I say that, I mean, they do have a little bit of extra weapon strength, which is okay. Uh, it does come in the form of extra armor piercing damage, I want to say, almost completely. Uh, let's see, 33 goes to 32. Oh yeah, so it is almost completely extra armor piercing damage, which is nice. They do have better attack, but in a game where melee defense matters a lot, they have less melee defense because they give up their shield for an extra sword. That also means they lack a missile block chance. And they have regeneration, which, while this is a useful trait to have, certainly, because your characters are weak line base to fire you are very very often going to be facing quite a bit of fire damage as the uh, tomb kings so having a unit that's you know 300 points more expensive less melee defense no missile block chance and has a critical weakness to something that your opponent's very likely going to be bringing means that for me the Ke kepper guard are just kind of kind of awful i mean they're not awful they are good Certainly, but I just don't tend to use them very much because of those various issues. Again, t uh, 1050 for a unit with 50 armor and only 36 melee defense. Like, even, forget about the fire damage, even just a unit of shock cap with a really good charge 
we'll flatten these guys pretty badly. Um, and it's just going to be super cost inefficient. So, I mean, they are okay, but I am certainly not the biggest fan. Uh, they only have one option for infantry skirmish, the good old skeleton archer, which uh, is pretty impressive that skeletons remember how to use bows. That takes quite a bit of skill. They're, they do have a pretty decent range, good AP values as well. I say that, the one AP per shot, but the, hey, they have 90 unit models, so volume of fire. Um, yeah, they, they basically don't have combat stats, so don't even think about it. Uh, the Regiment of Renown version, the Blessed Legion of something, uh, has Armor Sundering. They're essentially Rusty Errors. Again, long range, and uh, yeah, pretty much what it says on the tin. You've got your Armor Sundering Arrows to help your non-AP arrows do better. Moving on to Cavalry, we've got Skeleton Horsemen, which are a decent backline harass. The biggest issue that you're going to face with Tomb King's Light Cavalry is pretty slow. Uh, they're the slowest Light Cavalry in the game. 76 speed is kind of on par with like most Heavy Cavalry, um, whereas most other factions, Greenskins are a good example, uh, like Goblins are you know, 90 plus speed, I mean, even Spider Riders, Spider Riders are probably the most comparable unit, 78 speed for Light Cav, but Spider Riders also don't suffer forest penalties, so they can outrun other cavalry in the woods, um, but Skeleton Horsemen, I mean, they are cheap, they have Vanguard, 400 points for a mobile unit that has fear is not bad at all, they also have pretty decent stats for the cost, 22 attack and 26 defense is not too bad for a Light Cavalry in this cost bracket. Ne Nehekara Horsemen have even better stats. 28 attack, 35 defense is honestly not bad. 38 weapon strength, pretty solid. 50 armor, just kind of a decent all-around mid-tier cab unit, and especially with some of the buffs you have access to. I mentioned uh, the bonus versus large from the Overcast Cursed Blades. Nehekara Horsemen are a unit that in particular will benefit quite a bit from that. So, uh, useful, useful cab unit, absolutely. And now we move on to the fun part, the chariots. So, Tomb King chariot units come with nine unit models, which is quite a bit more than your standard three for most other units. There are some exceptions, but uh, yeah. Skeleton chariots, nine unit models, which means they do a ton of damage if they get all the unit models to get good contact. Uh, 58 charge, 34 bon with a plus 12 bonus versus infantry uh, on the weapon strength. Yeah, I mean, they're chariots. They run over infantry. That's pretty much what you would expect. And there's more of them, so they're better at doing it. There's also an archer variant, which uh, doesn't do a whole lot of missile damage, but it's something. Let's see here. Uh, da -da -da -da. Pretty decent AP values. Looks like they have a pretty short reload time as well, but honestly... I mean, there's nine unit models. They're going to do a little bit more than other archer chariots, but you really don't take them for the missile attack. You just basically upgrade them to the skeleton archer chariot if you have the points. But uh, speaking of actual skirmish cav, they do have skeleton horseman archers. Now, I want to say this is one of the longest range bow cav in the game. They are also probably the slowest skirmish cav in the game, I want to say. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but again, 76 speed means they are quite slow in comparison. However, they do have 140 range, which is just very impressive. Again, only 18 missile damage, 3 AP per shot on these guys, though, so they do have better AP values than the infantry skirmishers. And, uh, yeah, generally quite useful in a number of matchups. Uh, having the mobile skirmishers uh, can be quite good. And they are a pretty cost-effective unit as well. 500 points is where we see a lot of kind of the lower-tier skirmish calves sitting. And, yeah, for the cost, can be quite useful in the right situation. Speaking of which, Carrion are also in the same boat. This is kind of a monstrous. I say monstrous. They're not really monstrous, but I guess War Beast is a good way of putting it. Uh, flying unit. They have 18 unit models. They do count as infantry size, but they have good melee defense and good weapon strength. 40 total weapon strength, 46 melee defense means that they're a great, uh, kind of like fell bats, but with less models and more hitting power. Um, they can tie units down, uh, get into your opponent's back line, threaten and harass ranged units quite effectively. They are really, really good for chasing off routing units as well. And they do have a full 100 speed, so this is one of your few true fast attack units for the the Tomb Kings. 100 speed, 
means that you can really, really get get out and get aggressive with these guys. They're, they also have Vanguard, obviously, and cause fear. So just in general, Carrion are probably one of the best units on the roster, honestly. Just super, super cost effective for how, for how little you have to pay for them. I definitely recommend pretty much always bringing at least two, if not more, uh, Carrion in every, every single build. There's no reason to not have them. Yeah, just, I, I can't say enough about the, the silly dead birds. They're just great. Now moving on to constructs. So I mentioned earlier that constructs is a keyword. If we have a look at these construct units, you'll notice this icon here in the, uh, in kind of the ability bar. Construct is not necessarily an ability, it's just a keyword, but there are a number of abilities that only affect constructs. Notice that they also don't have the undead keyword. Like if we have a look at Carrion here, they have this undead keyword. Construct is a separate keyword. So, for example, um, if we look at the lore attribute here for Lord Nekara, you will notice that it heals specifically undead only. So this will not heal your constructs. At least it's not supposed to. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Going back to the units themselves, we've got Ushabti, Monstrous Infantry, Armor Piercing, uh, Anti-Infantry here, good melee defense and attack, 90 armor, uh, yeah, fairly straightforward, cost effective, heavily armored, Monstrous Infantry, they're great in the front line. They do have a bow variant, which has less unit models, only 9 instead of 12, but of course they have massive armor piercing missile attacks at pretty long range, 255 range is... On par with kind of some of the shorter range artillery pieces, um, but again, they do armor piercing and melee, so they kind of can hold their own there. It's not super ideal, but certainly you want them taking advantage of that massive 104 armor piercing missile damage. Oof, yeah. Uh, if you've played against the Tomb Kings, you know about Ushapti Greybows, so I don't really need to say too much there. Uh, so they do have a Regiment of Renown version. Chosen of the Gods, these guys have a scatter shot. They also have Shield Breakers. They will uh, give minus 24 Missile Block chance. And uh, yeah, better stats because they're Regiment of Renown, obviously. Just overall, a uh, very common pick. We also have Sepulchral Stalkers. And again, Regiment of Renown. These guys are interesting. They're, uh, yeah, they've got this Missile Attack here, which isn't wildly useful against... Uh, like single entity models, it's decent against Cav, but it's it does poison damage, and I don't know, it's just kind of weird. Um, they have charge defense against large, armor piercing, anti large damage, plus 24 bonus versus large. Not the best melee attack in the world, but they are pretty good at defending the back line. Um, so they're kind of like a, a anti large monstrous infantry, they have 12 unit models. It was kind of a little bit of a weird unit. You don't see them too often. They are useful in some niche situations, certainly against uh, heavy cavalry factions, especially so, uh, factions like Bretonia or the Empire. They could potentially shine in those matchups. But um, yeah, they're just kind of a weird unit, to be honest. I don't find myself using them super often. The Eyes of the Desert Regiment of Renown version does come with stock properly. Um, they have Vanguard, but the Regiment of, Regiment of Renown picks up stock as well. I want to say that's the only special ability they have, besides having, you know, better stats, obviously. But, uh, yeah. In terms of anti-cav tools, I would tend to prefer using Necropolis Knights because they have more unit models. You can see these guys have 18 unit models. Think of them essentially as demis with a little bit worse stats, but they carry poison innately. Uh, they have a regular and a halberd variant, so the lance variant has uh, just slightly better stats overall. The halberd variant, slightly worse stats, no missile block chance, but obviously picks up a plus 28 bonus versus large. So very good against enemy heavy cavalry or monsters. Uh, again, generally, you know, Empire, uh, I would say probably like maybe High Elves if they decide to bring a big dragon. There's a few other factions, you know, Bretonia, where the Necropolis Knights will be quite useful. In terms of single entity monsters, the Tomb Kings do have quite a few. We've got your Scorpion, which is your super, super cost effective cheap option. A uh, thousand points for Fear and Terror, Vanguard Deployment as well, which can be quite cheeky. 380 weapon damage with good anti-infantry, plus 15 bonus versus infantry. Decent combat stats for the cost. 
scorpions are really nice. You do see them quite often, and their animations make them notoriously difficult to deal with. Uh, they are quite quite good units. Uh, you do see them quite often. The Bone Giant is a ranged monster, uh, anti-large type ranged monster. It specializes, again, against enemy heavy cavalry, but it is decent against monsters as well. And even shooting it versus infantry, you can do some good damage. It has a plus 150 bonus versus large on its missiles, so uh, definitely meant to shoot at large targets. Uh, it doesn't have the most missile... Uh, missiles, I should say, ammunition in the world. Uh, 400 weapon damage in melee, 300 of which is armor piercing. Doesn't have very good combat stats though, and it is pretty slow on par with, you know, uh, regular giant like for other factions. Um, but yeah, Fear and Terror, generally a pretty useful uh, monster to take, considering it's only 1600. Uh, pretty good as far as monstrous artillery pieces go. 1800 for the Cameron War Sphinx. You generally see this more as a mount. People don't take the raw monster itself too often, but you can if you want to. It does have some dudes on the back uh, shooting bows, uh, you know, armor piercing anti infantry weapon strength, as you would expect. The Hero Titan is kind of a specialist monster. It does have a couple of bound spells, has Spirit Leech and Shem's Burning Gaze. It also gives you the Spirit Conduit here, which gives extra power reserve and recharge rate. If you're playing a super magic centric uh, build, like especially with like Kotep, for example, can be really nice to have a Hero Titan. They have really good stats to 56 melee attack for a monster is really good. 45 defense, heavy armor piercing damage, no special bonus versus uh, infantry or large, but keep in mind you do have that Cursed Blades to give it a bonus versus large if you want to. 100 armor as well. Uh, it is kind of slow, again, about the same speed as a giant, but. Uh, very powerful magic monster. Finally, you've got your world beater type monster, your anti-large AP, massive armor piercing damage, good charge bonus, great combat stats, 100 armor, Necro Sphinx. This thing is terrifying, and you've even got a Regiment of Renown version that picks up even better combat stats, 53 attack and defense, and magic and fire damage, which can be useful in a number of matchups. It also has fire resistance of 25%, and, again, since your opponent will very often be bringing fire damage, this uh, extra 25% fire resistance is actually more useful on this unit than probably a lot of other units with fire resistance. So, yeah, I do like it quite a bit. That being said, they are very expensive, and you don't see them quite as much as you used to because of some of the changes, but still, they are very, very good and very, very scary in a couple of matchups. We'll round things out with artillery here. We've got Screaming Skull, which doesn't actually do that much damage, but it does have a contact leadership effect of minus eight, which is quite nice. It also does magic damage. And the Casket of Souls, we sort of saw this with Kotep already, but again, extra power reserves. And it does massive uh, armor piercing missile damage with a multi shot, uh, seven projectile uh, shot. So. That pretty much rounds out the roster. We've covered more or less everything. Um, in terms of general play styles, the Tomb Kings actually, out of all the undead factions, have the best kind of combined arms approach because you're hitting every unit category. Um, even though you may not necessarily have a lot of variety in certain categories, um, you do still have options in each category. You've got you know, monstrous artillery, you've got regular artillery, you've got a lot of monstrous selections, monstrous um, infantry, you've got arm armor piercing missiles, you've got skirmish cav, really good chariots. Um, the thing you're lacking, I guess, is proper heavy cavalry. Um, but, you know, you can contest the cavalry game. You have one of the better kind of mid tier, I guess, one of the only medium cavalry in the game. There aren't really a lot of medium cav in this game, but I guess you could kind of consider Mechar Horseman medium cav. Um, they have decent infantry, and of course being undead, they don't again, partake in leadership, so that's a huge, huge benefit to them. Uh, they don't have the same raw healing potential as the other undead factions, but um, they do have... I guess I didn't mention one of their faction abilities here, the Realm of Souls. This gives three successively stronger heals. 
uh, the more Tomb King's units you lose. So you have to lose a certain number of units, but then when you hit number three, you also get a free Ushabti summon. So in every battle, you'll get at least one unit of free Ushabti that will, you know, last a little bit of time. With the changes to summons, it's not quite as powerful as it used to be, but the map-wide heal is certainly quite nice to have. And the fact that it's just built in, you don't have to pay anything to have this, is again, quite useful. But, um... Yeah, Tomb King's general playstyles, you can go a lot of different ways, and you can go ranged heavy, you can go super mobile with a lot of chariots, you can go infantry focused, you can go with the monster Death Star, there's a lot, a lot of different ways to play the Tomb Kings. Um, they are one of those factions that, uh, because they have kind of combined arms approach, there's multitude of different ways to play them effectively. But uh, certainly some common things you see are like some Bo Shabti, Kalita, if you really want to get crazy you can even take like a Bone Giant or two, have Kalita buff them up, uh, Cetra on his Chariot and just taking kind of a balance build with like Tomb Guard, um, let's see here, something like this maybe with some Spears, you could grab like a whole bunch of Archers, um, this is probably something you want to take maybe against like, I don't know, Vampire Coast? Let's let's put together a build here that looks reasonably decent. Probably gonna want some Nakara horsemen there, pretty cost effective. Um, and then of course we want Carrion as well. Yeah, something like this. This is a super super wide build, but this could give you know uh, fits to a number of different factions. You've got solid infantry, got a lot of archers, mobility. This is probably a little bit heavy on the Carrion. You could maybe cut cut down this Carrion and uh, bring some other things, but uh, uh, the point being, you can go a lot of different ways with the Tomb Kings, and to game plan against them, really the biggest threat in my eyes, sort of the highlights of the roster, obviously constructs, heavily armored monsters are a pain for a number of factions to deal with, so you definitely want to be aware that they can go quite construct heavy, they also are undead, so you're going to face map wide fear and terror, so you want to try and get immune to psychology or unbreakable as much as you can when facing them. Obviously the fire damage we've been talking about quite a bit already, but uh, yeah, armor piercing missiles can be quite good against the Tomb Kings. They are generally just kind of slow, um, they're really again, the only fast attack unit they have is Carrion. Uh, their next fastest units are all in I, like the 70s range in terms of speed. So you, if you are a super mobile faction, then you oftentimes can kind of outrun them a little bit, um, sort of drag them through the dirt in that way. But uh, yeah, that's the Tomb Kings pretty much in a nutshell. I've been rambling on now for about 40 minutes, so I think this is pretty good. Let me know if you guys have questions down in the comments below. I'll do my best to uh, answer them as you guys ask them. But hopefully you've enjoyed this video or found it useful in some way or another. Let me know in the comments down below what faction you want me to cover next. I am thinking I might do the Skaven and the Lizardmen um, next since they just got their DLC and it's now been patched. But uh, let me know in the comments down below. Hopefully you guys enjoyed watching. If you do like this sort of content, be sure to like, subscribe, hit that bell notification button. So every time I upload a new video, you'll be notified. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.